Uh, Larry, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, if anybody d doesn't hear me, if you'd speak up just so we know that. Everybody hear me all right? Yes. Yes. If, if you uh, don't have your video open, it would help. I'm going to do begin with a PowerPoint presentation. We're going to have opportunities for conversation along the way, but uh, I'm going to cover some material uh, here and uh, just want to kind of prepare you for that. Uh, let's see, I got to make sure how to get this thing. There we go. I want to begin with a little historical background. We're talking today about uh, what's theological, ed what's the future of theological education in a time of pandemic? I'm going to be throwing an awful lot of material at you, uh, but we'll break it up with uh, reaction times and that sort of thing. I'd like to go back to the 90s, a book by Edward Farley, where he was... Uh, discussing the uh, history, basically, of uh, theological education. This is nothing new to any of you, but just as a quick review. He talks about the pre-seminary period, where the <laughs> approach was to study the classics and then uh, be mentored by a pastor uh, about how you did ministry in that situation. And that lasted up until the seminary period, basically in the 18th century, where we began to develop specialization of disciplines and denominations began to, to form seminaries and then became separate graduate institutions with the fourfold distinction of dogmatics, church history, practical theology, and biblical studies. Um, <clears throat> I would say that my experience at Southern Seminary, at least as a student, would uh, have fit into this uh, separate graduate institution model. If I could quote him for just a moment, um, and let's see, I need to... Part of my slide is covered by pictures here. <laughs> the, sh the shift was not from piety to learning. A learned ministry was never seriously questioned in many of the church traditions. The shift was one from meaning of learning uh, from study which deepens heartfelt knowledge of divine things to scholarly knowledge of relatively distinctive theological sciences. So what we developed and part of what we still have in theological education is what we might call the scholarly guild. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to stop this for just a moment and ask us, uh, well, wait just a minute. I got to go back and move one more slide. Uh, hmm. Help me out here, Andy. I got to get back. Share screen. That's what I want, isn't it? Yeah. There we go. We can see it. Got it. Let's have a few questions. And, and what I'd like is briefly for each of us to share what was the most important aspect of your theological education and how well prepared do you feel you were for the life and work and ministry that you've experienced after your theological study? 
Now, please be brief and let's give everybody an opportunity who will to jump in and respond to these two questions, if you would. Who'd go first? If Larry, nobody volunteers. If you, Larry, if you, Larry, if you put us back, if you take those questions down now, we can see each other and discuss. Or you may want to, you may not want us to do that. I'd be fine. Oh, okay, thank you. Go ahead, you share first. Okay, I think the most important thing uh, I learned uh, was to think critically about uh, the Bible, uh, about uh, theology as it had been spewed from various pulpits, and later uh, with uh, Wayne Oates and Willis Bennett, about society and about uh, interpersonal relationships and personhood. Okay. Who else? I'll say something. Um, I'm with you, Wade. The most important thing, I think, and there's some of this is from college too, but teaching you how to read. Uh, I mean, you know, they just, it's, Seminary is the groundwork. You gotta you gotta do it the rest of your uh, ministry, but learning how to read, what to read, and how to read it critically, putting uh, connecting the dots, stuff like that. That was the most important, single most important thing at, at seminary. The second thing would be relationship building, uh, learning how to uh, stay in touch with friends for support and advice, stuff like that. Okay. Uh, Larry, uh, for me, I had never really been in an environment like the seminary environment before. Um, I'd always gone to school with people who were about like me. And all of a sudden I'm exposed to scholarly people, of course I had those in college, but uh, scholarly people about the Bible. I didn't understand what I was really going to learn when I got there. But I also met people that were so different from me and whose background was different from me. My life was literally transformed during those first three years of seminary uh, because it was such a different experience for me. I, I, I learned things I didn't even know existed. For example, I walked into my room on campus first time and here is this oriental uh, person there and I say to him, I'm Floyd Roebuck from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And he says, my name is Moriyoshi Hirishana from Wahia, Wahawahi, Territory of Wahi. Wow. <laughs> Looked at blank stare. Some of y'all remember Maury, maybe. You're not old enough. And then he said, most of my friends call me Maury. So my very first experience in a dormitory was from someone who, of Japanese ancestry who had come there from Wayland. Uh, to come to seminary. So I, I think the broadening of my world was a real part of that seminary education as much as, and in some instances, more than some of the book learning that I got. Okay, who else? I, I don't know if it's the most important thing, but, but a, there are several, but a very important thing for me was the integration of the life of learning and the life of the church. And I think a seminary has certain limitations as to how much it can do that. But I think Southern in the period when I was there uh, did that about as well as any seminary could. Yeah, great. A couple of more. I would say the broadening of aspects, just like Floyd said, I had been, a, I had a pretty narrow uh, experience, life experience. Went to a Baptist college, but still it was people like me. And going to a seminary and meeting people from all over the world and being exposed, as uh, Kyle said, to reading and books and learn that Catholics and Jews and other people were okay. You know, they weren't all going to hell, maybe. But being exposed to a wide variety of, of uh, experiences was great. And the second question, how well prepared, I think 
I was really well prepared in many ways. Uh, Dr. Graves' church administration course uh, prepared me for uh, meeting uh, and, and being in the administrative position in the church. Okay, thank you, Joy. For At me, least one more. For me, uh, I think I, I learned that uh, it's a mistake to think you have arrived in your theological thinking, always to be open to new truth and new insights. And of course, I was fortunate when I was in seminary that I had a little church. So that helped me incorporate what I was learning with what I was doing at the same time. Thank you, Bill. Henley Barnett was a great help to me, Wallace Williams here. And uh, just because he was such a down to earth, real person, and he had ministered to the poor. And I was working as a campus minister on the side at the University of Louisville, right in the middle of the Vietnam War, spending, spending lots of time counseling students who were afraid if they didn't make their grades, they were going straight to Vietnam, uh, or they could not protest um, and not go to a draft because their selective board did not uh, understand or accept conscientious objection. And um, it was right in the middle of a, a battle. And, um, and so Henley helped, helped me to get through that. And of course, Wayne Oates course in practical ministry was, was extremely important. Okay, great, thank you. Well, let's uh, jump into some information that I hope doesn't overwhelm us <laughs> or bore us too much. But one of the questions I've been dealing with uh, in some thinking I'm doing and some writing that I'm trying to do is where does a Baptist today go to get the best quality theological education they can? And the more I think about that, the more options keep arising because the, the landscape has changed so, so dramatically in the last 15 years that there are many choices. And so I would like to just uh, kind of run through the categories that I've identified uh, as options for Baptists today. The first I call the ideologically bounded institutions. Now we know what that means. There's a theological perspective you have to have to fit in. And I would put into that category the, uh, the six SBC seminaries, uh, the Baptist and multi-denominational evangelical traditions, and I'll explain a little bit about more what that means, to me at least. Some Baptist schools like Anderson University that are starting, that have started MDiv programs uh, as an addition to their tradition, Beeson Seminary at Sanford and so forth. That's one category. A second category, what I call the new university-based theology schools with a denominational tradition that is diverse in the constituency that is attracted. And I'm just going to quickly name them. You know them, but as a review, Baylor, Truett, Sanford, Beeson, Campbell. Now, Campbell is not an ATS accredited uh, institution, so I don't have uh, statistics about Campbell, uh, but they do have a school of theology now. Gardner Webb, White Seminary, Grand Canyon, and that's a unique situation in and of itself. I'll come back to in a minute. Hardin Simmons, which just this year closed Logsdon. Uh, the debate is whether it was financially motivated or whether it was theologically motivated. Uh, Mercer, McAfee, and Wake Forest Divinity School. 
these are newer and uh, choices that probably most of us in this conversation would lean toward uh, at the moment. Then there is what I call a set of experimental independent efforts. B.H. Carroll uh, got founded out of the conflict in the 80s at Southwestern Seminary, the Baptist Seminary of Kentucky, BTSR, which is now closed. Central is a separate institution uh, and the Leland Center. Those are kind of groups that are trying to do it differently and a kind of experimental way. And then there are the American Baptist seminaries, uh, Andover Newton, sort of Baptist. It's now merged with Yale. Berkeley School of Theology was the American Baptist Seminary in the West, Central, also CBF. So it's kind of a dual situation. Colgate, Rochester, Northern, and Palmer, which was formerly Eastern. And let's see if I can get down one. Not working here, Andy. Here we go. Uh, the next trend is the um, introduction and the expansion of online studies. Lloyd was talking about online funerals. Uh, this is where we are right now, it, it, an explosion of online programs. The ATS has now approved experimental programs for 100% online study for PhD degrees. Uh, that's a new reality. And if you look at Grand Canyon University, which is now a nonprofit, non-denominational, once was a Baptist school, uh, and Liberty, you can find the largest online MDiv study programs in the country. And you can complete a whole degree, a whole MDiv degree, and maybe be on campus to register or attend orientation or complete some aspect, but by and large, 100% study of MDiv programs and a host of others. Uh, and then there are what I call the outliers. They're multi-denominational choices that Baptists can make. They have large numbers of Baptists in their uh, uh, student bodies, Denver, Fuller, Dallas, Grand Canyon, Gordon Conwell, Liberty, now, Mid-America, I've made a mistake. There's a Mid-America Baptist Seminary in the ATS, which is a Mid-America Reformed. It's not, it's not Baptist, it's Reformed. It's really a Presbyterian school in Indiana. It has about 30 or 40 students, and I have included it in some data that I'll show you in just a minute, but you can just ignore that one. The Mid-America most of us know anything about is at Memphis. Yeah. It's SACS accredited. It's not ATS accredited. Has about 500, uh, about 500 students. And then Trinity Evangelical. Well, what do I do here? Uh, you may be clicking on the wrong window. There we go. I wanted us to look at some enrollment trends here. Uh, and I've put from 1980 to 2020. And I added up the total enrollment in all degree programs headcount, beginning uh, with 1980 in the SBC seminaries. And I, I want you to look at these numbers for just a moment. Mm -hmm. In 1980, the total was 9,033. In 1985, at the height of the SBC controversy, the head count was 11,167. And it went down every year thereafter until 2005. It took 20 years 
for the six seminaries to recover their total head count uh, in 2005 uh, before they were back to the same level that the six seminaries were at the height of the controversy in 1985. And then they actually declined from 2005 to 2010. It took them 10 years to get back to 15. And they've recovered in 2020, the SBC total headcount for degree theology degree, theology, church music, education, all of those in SBC schools, uh, it actually took 10 years for them to kind of get back. Excuse me, I got to go back on that one. Uh, go back. Now, what's happened though? If you look at these six seminaries today, every one of them has added a college to their degree program. Every one of them will count 25% of the college work toward an MDiv or a MA or an other graduate degree, uh, which means they've created a source of revenue by charging tuition to those students. And those counts are not included in these numbers here that I'm showing you. Uh, in 2020, Southern Seminary alone reports 5,500 students in all of their programs. A whole bunch of those are college students, Boyce College. Now, if we go to the, the alternatives, these are the newer ones, like where I taught at McAfee and Peter Ray taught, uh, Beginning in about 2000, we had 941 students. It grew to the biggest uh, number in 2015, and has in the last five years declined. Uh, and part of that is the closing of two of those schools, BTSR and Lang, uh, what is it? Logsdale. If you go back to the American Baptist, wow. The loss in 18, they had 846 students in 85. Uh, the loss of Andover Newton and uh, the closing of uh, uh, the decline rather of all of the others results in 318 headcount students in 2020. In all of the ABC seminaries. Now, one of the things that's clear to me is if you're located in the north, you're not doing as well as if you're located in the south and southwest and the west. The outliers jumped from 1846 to 4926, and there are two schools that account for that, Grand yeah. Canyon and yeah. Liberty. And those are all online growth situations. Now, any questions before I move to the next slide? Okay, I, there, I should have one. Oh, I've been talking the MDiv head count here. I needed to go back one. This is where I really started out. Excuse me for wandering around here the total head count of everybody. Typically 60% of your head count will result in an FTE count. Uh, now. Larry. Uh, yeah. A question. Sure. Like when you pointed to the SBC total in 2020, I thought I heard you say that Southern Seminary reported 5,500. They reported 5,500 total students, but they can't count their college students in ATS seminary counts. Well, this They've got a college and a seminary. Right now you have a SBC total for 5114. That's six schools. 
51 all 14 for all six. In div degree. Yeah, this is in div. And head count in all programs is 13,368. But there are fewer. Does, does, does your chart say that there are fewer MDiv students in Southern Baptist Theological Seminaries, or there were in 2020, than there was in 1985? Uh, two fewer. That's <laughs> right. So all of the promotion that we see from the seminaries about how great they're doing is not necessarily a reference to training ministers uh, in an MDiv program, but it's that the other correct. programs, such as their colleges. And when you consider that that total includes online students that are not basically on campus, and in Southern's case, six off-campus programs, uh, you actually have far fewer MDiv students on the campus of Southern Seminary today than you had in 1985. And then the question is, why has that happened? And that's- And it's also true, I believe, that cooperative program funding is undergirding all of their college students. Well, no, I didn't either. Uh-uh. We'll come to that in a minute. <laughs> well, okay. Yeah. Now, why has this happened? Did any of you listen to the BNG web uh, webinar Monday night with uh, our good new researcher in the world, Ryan Birch? Anybody say yes to that? Have any of you studied Ryan Birch? This is a guy whose book you ought to buy and read if you're interested in all in what's happening in the church today. It's called Nuns, in, not N-U-N, N-O-N-E. It came out March the 3rd. I just finished reading it day before yesterday. It's a remarkable piece of work. He's a master grassman. And I hope uh, you can see this graph and I'm going to spend just a little time uh, trying to explain it to you. If you go back to 2008 and you ask people uh, in surveys that were conducted over the 10 years from 2008 to 2018, uh, what their preferred religion is, what kind of church or organization or religion they attend, uh, there's one major group that is growing the fastest of any other. And that is this top line called no religion the nuns, if you ask them uh, what's their primary choice of religion, there are three responses if you're in the no religion category. Uh, atheist, agnostic, or nothing that matters to me. Those are the three choices. In 2008, those three groups, Catholic, see the red line, evangelical, the blue line, and no religion, the green line, were roughly the same size. Uh, our picture cuts it off, but when you get up here, more than 30% of the folks in 2018 say they have no religion. The nuns are the fastest growing group in the American population. The main line are all declining like a rock falling out of the sky. 
other faith groups are declining. The unclassified are basically stable. Jews and black Protestants are even. They have maintained the same level of activity over the past 10 years uh, uh, as they had in 2008. Now, this is three years old and I'm gonna go to another chart that's even more uh, challenging. This is a projection of the trends for the future based on this data. If you go all the way back to 1980 and project where we'll be in 2030, here are the nuns. See this line right here, no religion. And it goes up here to over 30% of the population of the United States in 2030. Now the question we would ask if we were pastor of a church is how do we evangelize these people? Burge response is atheists you don't and agnostics you won't. There may be some possibilities for the nuns, but they are much lower educated and struggling economically than almost any other group in the demography of what it looks like in the real world of religion today. Now, this is 2020, and this is about 2021. Can you see my marker there? Yeah. Okay. The nuns are today the same size as all the Catholics and all the evangelicals in the United States. And the main lines have lost dramatically. And the projections are much more challenging uh, well into the future. Now, <clears throat> I'll quote Ryan Burge on two other points quickly, and then we're going to move on and get to the meat of the discussion here. Uh, he believes that this trend became most dramatic in the 80s when the shift from uh, evangelicals on church life and theology moved to the political right. And if you'll read the book, Jesus and John Wayne, if you okay. haven't read Jesus and John Wayne, it'll open your eyes to why Paul Pressler was so darn successful in the Southern Baptist Convention beginning in 1979. Because there was this dramatic shift in the political background of evangelicalism. Uh, so uh, beginning here is when the growth of the nuns really took off. And there are two issues that matter. And I'm going to chart one of them. The first one, whoop. Well, I can't get to that yet. Let me just deal with Southern Baptists a minute. Am I boring you to death? No, no. You're depressing me to death. Oh, okay. <laughs> it is depressing. Uh, we all are depressed when we get through this. Retention rates. Now, this is a different source. This is more like a Gallup poll where the general social services interviews are with the same people every three years. 
So you go back to the same cohort and ask them the same questions every three years and you get your data uh, from that. So if you ask people over the age of 40 uh, what they were between 1985 and 1995, 75% of them would say mm -hmm. I'm Southern Baptist. In 85, they were Southern Baptist. In 90, they were Southern Baptist. Over the age of 40, uh, well, let's get back. I keep over the age of 40 was 69%. Older people left more than younger people, interestingly, a surprise to me. Uh, but then when you get to 2016 to 2018, under the age of 40, the retention rate is 56%, drops from 75 to 56. Almost 20%. 59%. From uh, over the age of 40, 69% to 57%. So you have a dramatic shift in the retention within the Southern Baptist Convention. And the question is why? That's by age. Let's look at it by gender. Not Let's much different between men and women. Can you show men the chart? 74% and 85 to 90. Women were 70. Then 2018 to 2016, it dropped to 57, down to 56. If you look at 2021, between 2018 and 2021, I think you'd see a much larger drop in retention of Southern Baptist women. If you look at the growth of the whole of the number of Southern Baptists on a chart, it's declined for the last five years. Now, if you look at race, not much difference. Whites, 72%, blacks, non-whites, 71%, whites, 57%, <clears throat> African-Americans, 56%. <clears throat> if you could look at that between 2018 and 2021, I think it would be much lower given the new controversy for black churches, though the SBC grew from roughly 500 African-American churches in 85 to almost 3,000 by 2020. Now, the two issues, the first one was LBGT discrimination protections. This is a chart of the religiously the unaffiliated, 82% of unaffiliated support or favor support for non-discrimination of gays. 62% of white evangelicals do. That's a 20% difference. 32% of evangelicals oppose and only 15% of the unaffiliated uh, oppose. So you do have a resistance factor at work related to the issue of the freedom of LB, LGBT persons. Uh, the other would be abortion, and I don't have charts on that, but those two issues seem to be the two issues that most explain this contextual change that's happened in the culture that is resulting in the decline of participation in traditional Christian bodies. Now, we haven't even begun to look at the impact of the pandemic on that. And I think three years from now, when we look at studies, we're gonna see a huge loss in attendance and participation by American people in the life of the church. Okay, I'm going, before I go to the next slide, 
and talk about a new model for master of divinity education, my wild haired idea. Anybody want to make a comment, raise a question or disagree with what you've heard? Well, let me comment very quickly. Larry, if uh, online education for uh, master's degrees seems to be more and more the trend and after coming out of the pen, uh, coming through the pandemic, more and more seminaries are moving toward online everything, so are universities. Churches are doing it more and more. But if you've got clergy coming out, pastors, who are formed and shaped by online education, it's going to be interesting to see um, how much emphasis will there be on in-person participation, incarnation ministry, for example, in the days to come. I just think it raises a lot of big issues. Okay. Uh, I think you've raised one of the two $64 questions. Uh, and uh, uh, oh, who's our friend uh, who left McAfee and went up to Brooklyn to be a pastor? Peter Brett Ray, Younger. can you help me out? Brett Younger. Brett Younger. Brett Younger posted on one of his things recently an anti-online uh, approach to church. Uh, and he has a point. There's a fundamental difference in sitting in front of a computer to do your learning and being in a group where there's conversation and a teacher in the room. We all agree to that. I would agree to that. Yes. However, that's not where we're going to be in the future. And so I'll jump in. The other $64 question is, who's going to pay for it? Uh, I went through 10 years of higher education, four years of college, seven years of seminary, and never paid $1 in tuition costs. I had scholarships that covered my tuition in college, and the cooperative program, program covered, I bet you everybody in this room, the, uh, tuition. Now, we had to pay some fees. We had to buy our books. We had to pay room and board. But we didn't pay tuition, did we? No. Any of you pay tuition at Southern Seminary? No. No. If you go to the 2020 SBC annual, and I've got a copy of it right here in my hands. I don't have a slide of it. But if you go and pull up the financial statements of the six SBC seminaries. And I'm going to only quote Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Their revenue, their operating income in 2019 to 2020 in tuition and fees was $25,802,807. Al Moeller collected 25 million plus dollars from the students at Southern Seminary. The college students paid $16,000 a year in tuition. What do you suppose the cooperative program provided? Anybody want to take a guess? Three million. Huh? Three million. Ten million. Ten million two hundred seventy-nine dollars. Thousand six hundred thirty-seven dollars. Tuition paid two and a half times what the cooperative program paid to finance Southern Seminary in 2019-20. Well, now that means 
a bunch of kids from Republican families are showing up or somehow people are paying their way for theological education today. They're also doing it in all of the newer SBC, a uh, newer college-based seminaries with one exception, one difference. Sanford. And that is, if you go to the McAfee School of Theology, you can borrow your tuition money from the federal government. And so we have students graduating owing $150,000 in student loan debt. Wow. And I'm going to suggest that can't keep going, can't last. <laughs> so the denomination is declining and the amount of money the denomination is going to invest in theological education, whoever the denomination is, whichever one, doesn't matter means that the theological education of the future has got to be congregationally based rather than denominationally based. And that's another feature of the change that has occurred in our church life today. In June, the SBC has a motion to change its name, and I predict it will pass. That after June, there will no more be a Southern Baptist Convention. It'll be the Great Commission Convention. <laughs> Why are you taking the name Baptist out? Any ideas? Because the fastest growing churches, not religion, but churches, are non-denominational. Mm -hmm. It's what I call the big box church over against the mom and pop church. I'm in a mom and pop church. We, have, we do well to have 80 in worship. My daughter goes to a church that has 27,000 in worship. And they don't support a seminary one. So that's my first suggestion about a new model for MDM. Second is we are going to have to have endowed schools that endow scholarships for admitted students. Yes. No endowment, no school. Right. And that's not an impossible dream given the wealth that is in some of our folks and given the opportunities for building endowments before you create a new school or a new program. Now, I know that's a pipe dream, but I would love to see a seminary of the future that only admits students to a Master of Divinity degree who are committed to work in a local church when they graduate. I'm not saying other people shouldn't go to seminary, but they can go to the other choices that are out there. Now, the third suggestion I'd like to make is that each student has to be employed in a ministry setting, a congregational or ministry setting. You want to be a chaplain in a hospital? Then you work in a hospital at the same time you work on your MDiv degree. Young. That you do not gather on a campus and study full time, and then you go out and try to practice. 
you study it and you practice it at the same time. Yep. Here, here. Yep. And the third suggestion is uh, the first year your study is on site in that congregation using an electronic resources learning model. We don't have to wait till, I've got a 2050 up there on the, on the slide. We don't have to wait till 2050. Uh, within five years, I predict that we will have the technology available to create virtual groups of classrooms with virtual professors that will be as powerful a learning model as anything else you can have because they will not just be online, you'll be in the room together with each other. <clears throat> North Point Church has a $75,000 screen that if you go to church there, Andy Stanley is preaching and you can't tell that he's not there. Right. It's a, what do you call that thing? Hologram. A hologram. A hologram. A hologram. <laughs> He's well, alive hologram up there. Sounds like docetism to me. Sounds like what? <laughs> docetism. Yeah, it is. Yeah. We're starting a new theology. <laughs> now, it's, a, it's the same old theology as you name. <laughs> Two years of study with short term cohort gatherings and electronic resources, that is you are studying electronically, but you're in a cohort with a mentor that is working with you and your faculty are specialists in their discipline and electronic dis delivery systems. That is no residential faculty. You get a, give a contract to the finest professors in their disciplines and pay them for their course. And then when you reuse it, they get a residual. And finally, you have a minimum of administrative staff and faculty. You don't need housing. You don't need admission, well, you do need admission personnel and so forth. And if you want a degree beyond the MDiv, you go to the traditional university-based programs or you do the online PhD that is now approved by the ATS uh, for the future. And the last point is Will accreditation matter? I don't have the answer to that one. Uh, I think effectiveness will be more important than accreditation, but more than likely, accreditation bodies are going to have to make the same kind of flexible adaptation uh, that the schools are going to have to make. Now I'm going to go out of this and back into where we can see each other and say, tear it apart. Who's the driver? Call, call me a heretic, call me what you want, but let's discuss it. I, I think it I, I think it is wonderful, <laughs> wonderful material and fodder. I'm wondering, Larry, in your mind, who who is the driver? behind a school is it the local church that a local church that establishes this is it who drives it and makes it happen well who was the driver for southern seminary to get started well in a sense the denomination nope no four teachers Huh? Who, who, who do we, who do we, uh, who do we idolize at Southern Seminary as the founder? 
Joseph Emerson Brown. No. Governor. Boyce. <laughs> James Pettigrew Boyce. Boyce. Yeah. Boyce. Without Boyce, there probably wouldn't have been a Southern Seminary. And Boyce inherited $17 million when his daddy died. Hmm. Or there wouldn't have been a Southern Seminary. Hmm. Uh, there will have to be individuals with a vision for a new kind of future who are willing to assemble the funding to make that happen. And that funding will largely come from congregations or congregational leaders uh, more than from denominations, in my opinion, at least. A lot of the drive will come from mega churches. I mean, they tend to drive so much in church life these days anyway. When they start doing it, everybody else will follow sooner or later. I think you're right. Yeah. And I had lunch with Al Moeller a couple of years ago. He spends three months of every year in California raising money for Southern Seminary. Hmm. Larry, this is right, frightening to me to think about it. Where are you going to build your own groups? How are churches going to find pastors, for example? Um, who is going to know who's available? Are there going to be a few um, kingpins that everybody goes to? In our peer groups is where we made our contacts coming along, and we helped each other. What's going to happen out there? Um, well, if you have mentoring peer groups, that same interaction can take place. Yeah. It may be virtual, but uh, you can have friendships that occur in that kind of milieu, it seems to me. Uh, but uh, if there will be key congregations, I think, uh, where that will take place just like it's taking place now. Uh, I know of two traditional moderate Baptist churches in uh, that are facing uh, votes on who to call as a pastor and they're they're getting overwhelmed with recommendations from other preachers not from school hmm. All right. yeah larry yeah um at southern when i was there in the uh, late uh, 50s or 60s uh support groups happened or they didn't there wasn't any planning for support groups for students thought that was a real lack. How would support groups develop in this uh, new uh, schema for seminary education? I'm, I'm doubtful that anything substance could happen virtually. Convince me otherwise. Can I do that? I have, I have hey, go ahead, Roy. I am leading uh, and have been for a year three courses, including a CPE in the parish with virtual support groups. The persons have virtual meetings with each other during the week in addition to their time with me. And I'm amazed at how they care for one another are emotionally engaged with each other. I was really opposed to it, but COVID dragged us into it. I've been really shocked, Lee. Uh, and I, I have students uh, move to tears with each other on this medium. Are they available to each other otherwise? Telephone? Uh, well, right now, my group of four CPE students are in Chicago, Indianapolis, Washington, D.C., and Appalachia. And they are not available to each other otherwise. They call each other. They pray for each other. Uh, 
it's been a shock to me. But many of them have grown up in the media age in, in which their best friends are on Facebook. And they uh, have not developed, I think, the capacity for, for touch and in-person sharing like you're asking for. And I'm wondering what the psychic of this younger generation who have grown up on media is, is going to be like in ministry. Thank you. Larry, this is Paul Richardson. I want to jump in with two or three things. One is that the seminary education most of us experienced uh, existed for less than half a century. Uh, developing it, improving it, and seeing it deteriorate. Uh, so it's pretty hard to get a long view from what, it, what we did, uh, either as students or teachers. Second, to the point that Wade just made, uh, if the church does not provide contacts, personal and professional, in the same way that the rest of society does, we won't have any reason to exist anyway. Third, uh, when I saw 2050, my first question was, can we even say what's going to happen in 2030? Yes. And then when I saw your list of items, every one of those things is already happening now. They aren't all happening together in many places, but everything you pointed to is already occurring in ministerial education. I Thank don't know whether that makes anybody feel better or worse, but yeah. I think you're spot on. Larry, um, I, I, I tuned in. Ray, we can barely, oh, buddy. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I tuned in late, so uh, I may be uh, way off base here, but somewhere I saw a question uh, that maybe you posted about what was most important to me in my theological education. Did you do that or am I? Yes, uh -huh. yeah. we talked about that earlier. Okay, well, then I'm sorry. Um, Go ahead. Well, I, I just wanted to say the most important thing to me in my theological education was rubbing shoulders with the professors uh, that taught me and being able to talk with them in the hall and uh, being able to go to their houses and have dinner. Uh, and the second thing was being with, uh, being in carpools and driving 300 miles with students and swapping sermons and uh, knowing what we were going to do on Sunday, but, but the live relationship between uh, the professors, my professors and me, and my peers and me, um, you know, quite apart from uh, the books you read and the courses you had, but those were very, very important. And I wondered, uh, number one, the people who've never experienced that won't miss it. <laughs> They've never had it. Um, so we're, you know, I would be longing for something that uh, they've never experienced and it doesn't matter to them. It just matters to me. Um, and I forgot the second thing I was going to say. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm a <laughs> Larry, could I say one thing, please? Yes. Um, several years back, when I was a state executive, the state executives group met and we commissioned one of our own to study the cooperative program giving for way back. And this was one who had just retired. And he came back and brought a report to us that astounded me. Now this would have been the early nineties. And he basically said this, that the, the total money spent by Southern Baptists on interest on buildings, having built buildings, was higher than all the money given to missions for all causes by Southern Baptists for 13 straight years. Uh -oh. So you want to talk about drains on money. Um, uh, the, the Birmingham News ran an uh, article, uh, Bob Terry might remember this, on all of the big churches that had moved to the suburbs in Birmingham and built multi-million dollar complexes. And it was quite a bit, if Bob, if you remember. And uh, several Baptist churches were cited. They, they retained the names, 
of their former um, uh, existence at such and such address where they would not let blacks in, then they wound up selling them home entirely to the blacks, block, stock and barrel. So they had their own church as they moved out to the suburbs. And so it was, it was a very mixed thing, but it was an astounding dollar figure. Um, when I was working in New York, um, the Baptists used to send up there to the New York Times what their latest total gifts were to the offering plates. At that time, it was pretty low, two or $3 billion. And the New York Times would take that, print it in block print, and put remember the neediest underneath it and wherever they every time they got that particular uh, release um, I think you know we're under judgment about a whole lot of things and a lot of assumptions about what's what and what's important and uh, the seminaries perhaps are just the beginning in seminary education um, and, and and I think the ver the lessons that we've learned through uh, the virtual life, uh, is going to be very telltale in some very large ways. Um, and so, oh, 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 by the way, i say one other thing. Uh, while I was in <clears throat> Birmingham teaching, um, Bill Hybels came at that time. He was still in good standing, the largest church at Willowbrook there in the north side of Chicago. And we were asking him about where do you send your, your staff to seminary? Well, we don't do that. We train them all here in the church. And uh, we pick out the people we want and we um, look at, you know, how well they responded to what they've done here and how well they're doing their job. And they might take a course or two, but I understood that for mega churches, this was very common. That was what the data showed us around Birmingham, regardless of, of denomination. And there we had, of course, Beeson sitting right there uh, with five different non-Baptists on the faculty. And uh, we're learning a lot about what was going on in the educational world outside of our cubby hole. Um, and so, oh, oh, by the way, Beeson was started, um, of course, with a very healthy endowment. And there was a fund set aside out of that money to pay completely the tuitions of all the students who came in, uh, if they could get in. We only admitted one out of two applications. And that was the model you were talking about. So. It's kind of a prototype in some ways. I don't believe they've increased the, the endowment much since then. I'm not sure about that. And they're still under the rubric of administration of Samford uh, that's doing well. Uh, and I don't know how that's gonna all play out, but um, uh, at least the students got their tuition paid and, right. and they did not have to pay uh, the, the, the average tuition to go to Samford University. Uh, that can probably be done by several universities if they decide that's important enough. And one of the benchmark visits we had from the, from the Dean of, of the Duke Divinity School, well, after he did his work and came and gave us a report at the faculty meeting, he said, look, he said, uh, you, uh, you guys don't realize what a privilege it is for you to teach here. And we were all thinking, well, I don't know, the salary's still pretty, pretty modest. He said, we have to go to zero budgeting every year at the Divinity School at Duke. He said, your president loves your school and most of the administration over there. And they're committed to fund you all, you know, come thick or thin. And, but he said, it's going to be, um, you know, if, if you, you just don't realize how blessed you are. They're committed to help you survive with quality. That's probably going to have to be the model. You've already mentioned that as one of them, that we're going to have to start schools uh, at universities that are dealing seriously with tuition about students and have the undergirding money to, to pay for other expenses. And even that might become a luxury that can't be con continued. If you have the endowment to provide the tuition for each student in your program, you can pay for the faculty and all yes. your other expenses. That's it. Uh, uh, we. We've got some situations now, I won't name any in particular, where there's healthy endowment, but not many, in, not many students. There's a significant drop in applications and attendance mm. in a lot of schools as far as a uh, student body is concerned. That's interesting, yeah. Very. Okay, uh, who else? 
Thanks, uh, Larry. I'm, I'm a part of something that's a very, uh, it tracks very closely with many of your emphases. I, I want to start by saying uh, thanks for the Seminary Friends uh, Network. I, I watch a lot, but don't interact a lot. So I'm glad to, uh, you know, finally get in on something uh, interactive. And thanks, Larry, for your typical cutting edge kind of, of thinking about what's going on that we need to be thinking of. Uh, by way of background, of course, uh, my seminary education was was outstanding in the doctoral level. Having yeah, you were in church and community, weren't you? <laughs> but uh, I spent 15 years with Union Baptist Association in congregational consulting, uh, six at Houston Baptist in the Christianity department. I'm just about to finish 11 years and retire in June uh, as president of one of those multi-denominational schools. A Houston Graduate School of Theology, started by Quakers in the in the eighties. Uh, now, uh, people of color comprise about eighty percent of our student body. Uh, like many schools that are smaller, you know, one hundred and fifty, two hundred uh, students over the years, it's a real challenge to pay all the bills and provide quality education, which we have been doing, in my opinion. But, but we have recently become uh, acquainted with. Uh, committed to uh, what's described as competency-based theological education. Some of you may know about CBE or the theological mm -hmm. variation of it called competency-based theological education. Uh, it's been around in the university world for a long time, but uh, we have actually become one of five schools in a network or a consortium of schools uh, that's going to ultimately be called Kairos University, uh, started by uh, Sioux Falls Seminary, where Stan Grins was uh, many, many years ago in South yeah. Dakota, yeah. but now also uh, apprised of Evangelical Theological Seminary in, uh, in Pennsylvania, of Taylor Seminary in Edmonton, Ontario, another non-ATS school. Uh, what, what is distinctive about CBTE is, in many ways, is that the students learn in their context, just like you describe in a firm. It, it's not the artificial move into a classroom, you know, on a, on a regular basis. You learn in your uh, setting, whatever that setting is, congregational ministry, non-ministry, if you will. Uh, although classes are still available as a learning experience. But, you know, all of our seminary classes are designed, maybe divined, to achieve certain outcomes. Well, in this model, all the outcomes are the list that you pay attention to, not just working through each of the classes, hoping that you get the outcomes, but the student with a mentor team determines which of the outcomes he or she needs to, wants to be working on at any given time. You have a faculty mentor who brings that kind of theological expertise to what they need to be reading, what the resources are. They have a vocational or a ministry mentor who is that guide to what it actually looks like uh, on the field. Uh, and a personal or a spiritual mentor who makes sure that the character part of their learning experience is holistic. But unlike, as you described, this historical ideological kind of bias, uh, or even in the non-denominational non, uh, schools, kind of theological flavors, if you will, that student, uh, the, their, their educational experience can be customized for them. So at Sioux Falls, they, they've got ELC, uh, uh, Evangelical Lutheran, you know, the most Protestant group, uh, you know, and conservative Baptists. But the faculty mentor works with them to help them uh, discover learning experiences that, that fit where they are. So the theological uh, portion of it is very customized. It's very integrated. Uh, because you don't have a high overhead, it's very inexpensive. Students sub pay a subscription fee of $300 a month. Uh, that's a third of what we charge and we're not expensive. $300 a month and as long as they're in the system, they can be pursuing these outcomes. Now, hmm. being careful about it, all these outcomes can be matched with classes, traditional classes. So ATS accepts it, 
federal student aid of which many of our students uh, are dependent. Uh, they can borrow money because they can say these classes equate with these competencies or these outcomes. Mm. I, I'm really excited about this because it is as you describe in the firm, really richly uh, oriented to context, to ministry. Uh, our, our expression of who's driving it is the student. They have to be pretty motivated to do this, uh, but they have the resources of real life people, whether it's face to face, online, by phone, with their mentors, uh, which online doesn't have, uh, but it has the flexibility of using the technology. So our students this fall, they can come to the classes that we offer here on campus, but they can study online with the students in Edmonton or in uh, Pennsylvania or, or wherever. Mm. So you can go to our Houston Graduate School of Theology website and see some descriptions or go to the Sioux Falls website and, and look up the Kairos Project, which they called it initially. I think it incorporates a lot of what you're describing, but it mm -hmm. does still, I believe, escape some of the institutional uh, heritage of endowments to pay for a lot of faculty, to pay for a lot of buildings or even a little building. Now, I, I still think that it has the challenge of how you, it, it's, it's borrowing on what we have in the past as uh, theologically trained people, especially at the doctorate level, uh, for, I mean, who's going to produce those people, in other words. I think your, your answer is, you know, we're ultimately going to have to still be dependent on the university systems and some of the seminaries for a while. But frankly, a lot of our DMIN students and other DMIN folks are really, really well designed to be the kind of faculty mentors that these students need because it's highly integrated with life and leadership, uh, as well as the competencies of theological and, and biblical expertise. Thank you. James, thank you for that. Well, that's exciting to yeah. hear mm -hmm. about. And, uh, Amen. Looks like you're already ahead of us. Well, I tell you what, to be retiring at the time that we're handing this off, not to wonder whether two years from now there'll still be a school, is a, is a great grace uh, to us. Uh, but in God's timing, we're very excited about it. Greg Henson, H-E-N-S-O-N, is the president of Sioux Falls. Greg is a, just a brilliant young man who's really, who's really led this charge. But ATS is all over this. Even Graham goes to all the meetings. It's been three, four uh, two or three annual gatherings uh, when the regular CBE associations uh, meet. And I think it, it responds to a lot of the criticisms and even the shortcomings of the, of the scientific university model that, that we simply uh, borrowed. Uh, we've, we've had these voices crying in the wilderness in pastoral care, I'm looking at Wade, and, and of a field education that have tried to supplement what we've done over the years. But this just zooms past our, our uh, adaptive kind of strategies to being holistic from day one. Okay. James, we looked at that model two years ago at BSK mm -hmm. and decided that we were already doing some of that. And our classes are in the classroom at Simmons Bible College, linked mm -hmm. on Zoom with a classroom in Georgetown, Lexington, and then individuals all over the United States. And we have local mentors, and then we have them in, in small groups. And we found uh, the, the students are uh, able to support themselves because they're in their parish wherever they are. Mm -hmm. They're getting the experience because that's how they have to live. Mm -hmm. Every student has less than $10,000. Well, uh, it's less than 5000 for average. I think we've had only two or three with more than ten thousand dollars in debt when they graduate. My good. Very the good. Challenge for faculty, <laughs> one of the little quips is that the faculty have to learn to change from being the sage on the stage to being the guide on the side. By the side. Which is <laughs> a, a, a clever yeah. variation. The that's other thing from, is that's from James Zoll book, The Art of Changing the Brain. Oh, okay, okay. So that that's not uh, new with them. Well, I'm not surprised. And, Alan Culpepper put me in touch with that book a couple of years ago as an, a new way of uh, modeling. Also, our entire faculty had to go through training of how to communicate virtually. 
as over opposed to communicating in the classroom or reading a manuscript. What, would you say that book title again? The Art of Changing the Brain, James Zoll. It's an older book now, a decade old, but it's the summary of the neuroscience uh, and the changing of neuron paths in the brain and its application to education. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're very attentive in this system. Changing the way people think, yeah, changes the way they feel. Yeah. And that begins to impact their worship and the rest of their experience with each other. The other point, Larry, that I was going to make earlier is uh, accrediting bodies outside of ATS and the church are going to demand a certain level of accreditation in our new models. And uh, they're finding, uh, even Liberty Seminary, I came to CPE and said, how can we get our students accredited? Nobody will hire them. And, and so accreditation is going to have to be worked out. ACPE is merging with Association of Pastoral Counselors and probably the Association of Professional Chaplains to provide an umbrella accreditation for specialty trained persons in theological ed education. I, I can only wish we had some type of uh, group to help us monitor quality education for the local church. Okay, mm. that's a good suggestion. Peter Ray, can I impose on you a minute? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, Peter, Peter Ray's lived in both of these worlds, pastoral world and the theological education world. Any comment you'd make about this discussion in the direction? Uh, I'd be happy to, uh, Larry. First of all, I just appreciate what you've done and other people are doing in terms of fresh ideas because we are in a change, change and uh, changing world. I would say further that for those of us who went to seminary, in my case, Southern, who also did a church uh, or uh, something uh, comparable, uh, were able to put things together in a way that you did not happen only in the classroom. Uh, I would say that, that Southern Seminary that I knew and loved and enjoyed enormously and considered one of the best seminaries in the world up to 1992 or whatever it was. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it had some limitations, and I think it was in the practical area so far as uh, moving a church, uh, uh, growing a church, building uh, out in some way. So I would register that as, as so as not to imagine everything is an intellectual uh, uh, solution. I would I would challenge this group uh, to consider what I'm about to say. Uh, to consider uh, putting uh, tuition scholarships in your wills, and I'm not representing anybody, uh, but I would I would suggest you at least think about uh, that uh, possibility. And uh, I, I believe uh, that there is potential of fresh time, uh, and some of it I suspect is in the contemporary churches. I have a grandson, uh, perish the thought, but it's uh, I, I'm getting used to it. Uh, he is on a staff at Passion in Atlanta and is doing very well at it, I might, might add, and, and is learning uh, some uh, fresh uh, things from that setting. They also bring in uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, notice, uh, to teach them and, to, and for them to get a degree while they're working there. The positive in that, uh, from my perspective, is they're getting Greek and Hebrew and, and Bible extensively theologically would be another matter, and, and I, I'm certainly not disturbing him uh, with that because he's on, on a good trip. The other things I could say, I, I thoroughly enjoy this afternoon. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Anybody else want to jump in on this conversation? I just want to say hi, Peter. I haven't Hello. seen you. I haven't seen you since I was a student at seminary with you. Wow. <laughs> That's been a while. <laughs> you look, you look <laughs> a little different. <laughs> but uh, I want to go back to one, one, uh, your, one of your original questions. Um, what was the most important aspect of theological edu education? And it has been in and out of my mind. An experience, one experience that uh, I was singing in the choir when Martin Luther King spoke in chapel. 
and that has reverberated throughout my ministry, um, especially in relation to interracial relationships. Here in Nacogdoches, we have a relationship with a sister black church, uh, our church does. And the uh, first time they, we had a Martin Luther King service and they discovered that I had been there when Martin Luther King spoke, man, mm. <laughs> that was uh -huh. really impressive. But that really reverberates still every day with me and my seminary education. Thank you for this wonderful discussion. I, whew, it's a lot to consider and, and, and pray about too. I can't see that we can totally forsake the per in-person uh, teaching e learning experience. This is great, you know, it's great that we have this ability to have uh, Zoom meetings and whatever virtual learning, but there's nothing like that touch on the shoulder or handshake or hug when we need it. So uh, it needs to be included in whatever future education we have. And I'm, I'm not gonna be here, so I just hope that it gets here. <laughs> I just want to add, I, I, I'm, I feel very connected to the, uh, the relationship part. That was a very important part of, of seminary for me mm -hmm. yeah. in the 70s and 80s. One, one other thing, though, I think is we, we need to find ways to involve a local church in, in seminary education. Yes. Uh, and, and, you know, my experience, all these churches in southern Indiana and Kentucky, these small churches, they had a part in our education. They were like putting us through school and letting us have an opportunity to learn and develop our skills. I think they owned part of our education, whether they were conscious of it or subtly, subconsciously. And uh, there needs to be more a part of that. Now, I've been in American Baptist Church's life these last years in Indiana, but, it, but it's interesting that we've, we've got this pilot project with Northern Seminary. President Bill Shield comes out of our CBF Southern Baptist Culture, First Baptist Knoxville, uh, but where we had we started with three three people. They're in partnership. They're in a congregation. So the American Baptist Churches of Indiana region shares the tuition money with that local church and Northern, and that partnership to to get an education. And of course, they're getting the in church local experience as well. And I think that there's a model. There's something in that model that also is helpful. Uh, but and I like it because it involves a local church who who has ownership of that. And then finally, in Indiana right now, we have a lot more bivocational pastors who have very little education. And how are we going to uh, connect up with folks like that? Uh, mm. Because of the financial pressures for medium-sized congregations, they can't pay. They don't have the funds for a full-time pastor and, and a well-resourced pastor. And that's an issue, I think, as well. How, how are we going to get pastors for these mid-sized churches in the days ahead? Well, maybe we need to talk more about bivocational pastors. That, that's been a track that Southern Baptists have had for years. I don't know if they still have it. I don't trot with the Southern Baptists anymore, but uh, they have experience in the business world or whatever they're doing, and that offer often um, behooves their ability to, to help in a local church and lead and guide and listen, And but they also pay their own way. And um, uh, we had all, had a few in Pennsylvania when I worked there, and they were they were very good pastors and very good people. I really trusted them and appreciated them. One thing occurs to me uh, regarding uh, the church uh, as a community of comfort. I hope. Um, uh, churches in the future will become uh, or find a way to be communities of comfort that uh, my wife and I uh, experienced when our first son died. Our church uh, was just magnanimous 
in uh, reaching out to us as a community of comfort. And the touch mm -hmm. was uh, something I would never want to give up, never. It is a sacrament to be touched by someone who loves you in Christ. Amen. Yeah. It's, we must uh, not lose that. It's, uh, I think for probably most of us in this group, that is a part of what our theological education was about. And I think that whole that old business of that causes us to stumble so much over online learning is that we became somebody. We became who we were in the process of getting a theological education. It shaped our, it shaped our personhood and not just what we know. This theological education is about more than, as we would all know, it's about more than learning stuff. It's, it's about becoming uh, something, someone who's different. And I guess I, I despair to, to some degree about how that happens in the future. Formation for ministry, David, is so important. And I think we're all struggling with that, how that happens in creating meaningful peer groups and meaningful education uh, in the place of ministry. Yeah. I agree with the, uh, the value of touch and, and hug and uh, would remind all of us that one thing COVID has caused is we've had a half a million people die with no one able to be in the room, fam family, pastor, anyone. Yeah. Oh. And that has created a multitude of guilty family members that our chaplains and pastors are having to deal with. And I think that the key, from my perspective, is when we listen to the pain of our congregations and prepare people to respond to that pain, uh, then we're church, church is going to be church again. Yeah. There's one other dimension. Uh, <clears throat> that I'm going to sound like an old timer here. <laughs> uh, there's a, what I would call an evangelistic challenge to this new culture we're living in. And I don't know what the answers are there, but if we don't find a way to touch these nuns, <laughs> out of the church, into the church, uh, we're going to die. In fact, a lot of congregations are going to die <laughs> in the next 10 years. Uh, and I don't think there are any easy answers there, but there need to be a lot of uh, leaders, leaders, models something that uh, will help us reverse some of this secularization process that's going on if it's reversible. Well, I'd like to Larry, believe that it could be. Larry, do you remember the book, The Gospel Blimp? Yeah. yeah. Introduced me to it, and it was the family trying to get tracks and evangelize their neighbor, and the neighbor had cancer in another church ministered to them and they went to that church and they the evangelist couldn't understand uh but it was exactly because they 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 met their need yeah a ministry that our community has you know, come in the last few years is theology on theology on tap uh, if you heard about it it, it was begun by the catholic church but it's international now interdenominational and uh, we've gotten involved here. The purpose was to reach out to the nuns and have a discussion of theology or whatever in a uh, secular setting, specifically a bar or a winery or whatever. We meet in homes and in restaurants and different places, but it's, it's brought together people who are fringe. Um, we haven't evangelized. But we've had some stimulating discussions right now. We're 
uh, using the sum of us, the book, the sum of us, S-U-M, and uh, discussing various chapters of that each night. Uh, but Theology on Tap, you might want to check into that for community ministry. Okay, right. Larry, I'm wondering if the uh, researcher you were quoting went into any detail on why the nuns are rejecting religion. You spoke about a correlation between the rise of politics and uh, evangelical churches, but were there other yeah. things that drove them away? That's right. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think a minute about his data. He confesses, uh, he is also a pastor of an American Baptist church in Illinois. And he talks, he's been there about 10 years now. And he talks about how uh, when the church was founded, maybe 30, 40 years ago, they had 300 people. When he became the pastor, they had 50. Now they have about 15. So he, he's no miracle worker yeah. when it comes to addressing the nuns. But he's convinced that the only way that will happen is through connecting and learning to listen rather than to tell and to create social interaction that is the beginning, a place where people can be touched, if you will. But he doesn't have a lot of uh, stories of where that is occurring. And his argument is that the mega churches, the non denominational churches, are being successful because they're putting few expectations. Uh, most of them don't have membership, you don't join the church. You show up, you participate, but there's the emphasis is on the dynamic of the worship, the music, and the interaction. Uh, but there's a there are as many people leaving those places and going to somebody else's big box church as coming into. So yeah. it, it's it's Thanks. pretty complex. A book that's really helpful to me is Charles Taylor's The Secular Age. It's a really heavy read. It's a, and it's a philosophical more than a sociological approach. But, uh, but just in terms of understanding what's happening in, our, in, our, in the contemporary world and in our culture, um, it, it's, it is a very helpful read. Okay, David, we need to wrap up. Yeah, I was going to say a, a point that um, I thought of a moment ago, as it was mentioned with Ann Davis, she said that the need justifies the ministry and the ministry validates the message. And that's where some of that touching and reaching out comes together. Uh, and that was an important thing to me. I do want to uh, thank everybody for participating and let you know that on May the 20th, Emmanuel McCall will be leading our Zoom meeting. Wow. And right this at this particular time, I think he's in process of moving into a senior adult uh, community, but um, Emmanuel McCall will be leading our discussion very May good. 20. And that should be very interesting, his perception on and perspective on a lot that has been happening and is happening now in our communities. What's the date on that, please? May 20. May 20th. Uh -huh. I, was, I was a classmate of his. Yeah, Good it, should be a, it should be a great, uh, a great session as well. Larry, this has been wonderful. Thank you so yeah. much for the time and effort put into all of this and, and for everybody yeah. else that participated. It was very good. Yes, wonderful. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Thanks to Andy for all yeah, Thank help. you. Make thank yes, you. Andy, thank pulling you this much. together, getting it together. Mm -hmm. That's good. We will have a recording which will be available online in a day or so. So you can watch it again or send a link to somebody that may have missed it. I found it very stimulating too. Thank you very much, Larry. Welcome. Yes. Thank you, Larry. You're welcome. Good to see you, Lee. Larry, you're, uh -huh. you're the one that connected me. Hey, Bob. Me up. 
this I was, here. I was watching Bob waving <laughs> over there a while ago. How are you doing? Hi, Wallace. Hey, hey, Sorry. Bob. Bob, good to see you. <laughs> well, both I of you. I think a lot of us want to thank those of you who put this together. Uh, yes. Your professionalism. So, um, yeah. Thank you, Larry <laughs> and Al and uh, David and all the rest of you who made it happen. Thank you. Amen. Uh, here, here. Uh, David, could I have 30 seconds? <laughs> hey, it's your turn. turn. It's your time. Well, I was sitting here listening to all this and, and I I thought back, I have devious thinking. I thought back to this student that met me in the hall when I was the Dean at Boyce and he was gonna get a certificate. That was before we were doing degrees. And he said to me, Dr. Johnson, I'm so excited. I have never graduated from anything. I even flunked out of welding school and I'm getting a certificate from Boyce Bible School. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Amen. <clears throat> That's my contribution today. <laughs> Good contribution. Good contribution. <laughs> Appreciate it, Andy, all that you've done, and we'll be looking forward to a recording.